Well, uh, please forgive me if my uh, voice goes out this time. I, I've, I'm getting a little cold, I think. But um, I'm very glad to be here uh, in this 10th inaugural edition of uh, GIDS. And uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, this session about uh, deep learning. Um, deep learning is a very uh, kind of hot topic now. I think a lot of people are talking about it because um, it allows us to solve a problem for many years that, um, that, that's been very, very difficult. Uh, these simple things that we can do, uh, like speech and, uh, and s recognizing images, is something that for, for a long time computers have had enormous difficulty doing. We've sort of figured out mm, how, how to get this to work, but um, it's still in a, in a very exciting stage where uh, it's greenfield technology. And uh, you can apply this uh, today to get very good results. Um, but First, I'd like to talk about um, what machine learning is and uh, what we can do with it um, and why this stuff works. Uh, and then we'll go into some code. We'll talk about how you can use um, a framework called TensorFlow to write uh, uh, deep neural nets. And we'll talk about um, something uh, called scikit-learn, which is a framework for Python um, that works very well for uh, sort of classic machine learning, um, supervised learning stuff. And uh, doing data science. So um, we'll talk uh, briefly about, well, um, what is three? This is uh, a question I think is, you know, maybe you don't, you don't hear it all the time, but what do you think um, three could be uh, three objects, uh, three um, stars in the sky or three particles or um, it comes in all different shapes and sizes. And uh, this concept of threeness um, is something that we know very kind of intuitively, but it's very difficult to teach a machine. Um, we could give it like lots of examples of three, but for a long time it wasn't able to figure out what the pattern was. Um, so they, you know, threes come in all different orientations. This is something that um, confounded some of the smartest um, people working in AI for uh, decades. Um, and so there's this other idea, and um, which is sort of very similar. And uh, you have the idea that you, know, you have these objects in the real world. And maybe they're, they're just, um, they're, they can be approximated by a function. I, we can think about uh, machine learning as approximation. And there's some sort of function in um, like a high dimensional space that will output um, all of the examples maybe with a little bit of noise. Um, we can call, think of this like a, a generator, a real world generator. A function that's generating all of these concepts and images and sounds that we're, we're hearing. And what we'd like to do is approximate that function so that when we receive an input from the computer, we can, um, we can uh, recognize it uh, for what it is. So um, this idea of dog, uh, what is a dog? Uh, it has some fur, it has some, uh, four legs, you know, a tail, and uh, there's some pattern here, but it's very, very difficult to say what it is um, if we were to engineer these features, right? You could say, oh, well, a dog has a certain um, leg length. It might have a, a, a girth, a torso girth, and uh, we could try to program the computer to recognize these things, um, but we would miss, um, like, a bunch of different dogs that are tr truly dogs, and uh, we'd misclassify um, things that aren't dogs as dogs with these, these simple heuristics. So for years, they tried to use heuristics like this to do image recognition. And um, particularly, uh, one, uh, one area that I'm interested in is speech recognition. And speech was a long time was a total mess. And still is um, in open source kind of uh, land where you have some very simple, uh, naive uh, implementations of these. One example was um, CMU Sphinx, which I, I demonstrated um, uh, la on Monday uh, with my colleague Nikhil Nanavadikar. We showed um, how to control a drone um, with, your, with your voice. Uh, it didn't work so well, but um, that, that's uh, partially the reason why. Uh, so the idea is that we try to break out um, different uh, ideas of what a word is and try to teach the machine, um, well, this is what the phoneme sounds like, and this is the uh, words in our dictionary, and um, this is a very brittle process. It requires a lot of um, tweaking and um, handmade feature engineering. So this is um, one area where 
um, we really didn't figure out how to do very well until recently. Um, recently, we have uh, very powerful machines and very smart algorithms and lots and lots of data, which is probably the most important thing. Um, um, so these, these have allowed us to do uh, recognition, um, prediction, um, classification, lots of uh, very interesting things that um, businesses want to do um, for, um, for lots of reasons. But um, fundamentally, uh, this is something that a lot of children can do very easily. And so we, were, we had to, this kind of paradox, it's called Mer Moravec's paradox, which is someone who's like 10 years old could do this, and uh, the smartest computer scientists in the world couldn't teach a computer how to do um, these types of problems. Um, and the, the emphasis here, even though we've made um, kind of incremental improvements in hardware and algorithms, is that we've had so much data um, to train these on. And the availability of um, models that are, uh, where the information is open source has um, spurred an enormous um, a revolution kind of in, in machine learning. So which is lots of, uh, lots of different applications. Um, we can uh, recognize people's handwriting very well. Um, so if you write um, math, you can do that uh, on a tablet. Um, if you uh, write uh, lang languages where it's difficult to type, or you know, you, you, the natural way is to write it, uh, you, know, you have uh, logographic languages like Chinese, and um, maybe to an extent uh, certain types of Hindi, I don't know. Uh, but you have an alphabet, I guess, in Hindi. So. Um, but this is, this is getting very, very good uh, in that not, we can not only uh, recognize it, we can generate examples of these by using a computer. So this is something where they're catching up to us, I guess you could say. Um, and you can use this for education. So this is something that I'm very interested in, um, using uh, machines to kind of teach us to become better at whatever we're doing. Um, so this is kind of an example where you're, uh, you have somebody who's very young and they're reading uh, sentences in a book trying to learn English. Um, maybe this is a very common thing to do to recite uh, phrases. And so um, we could use something uh, like speech recognition to teach them um, you know, the correct pronunciation um, so they didn't have to do this and somebody didn't have to like, stand by them reading books and so forth. Um, speech synthesis is getting very good as well, um, which is where you're, you're reading um, uh, books or sentences um, in natural language um, from using a computer. Um, so there's lots of different applications for these for content generation, for, um, for recognition, for doing um, interesting uh, kind of creative stuff as well. So this is an example of um, something uh, called a, a GAN, kind of exploring the space of possible faces. Um, and these, these can be thought of as um, maybe points in a higher dimensional space where each point um, represents uh, an image that has lots of different pixel values. Um, so when you're thinking about these, um, these, these ideas, let's just think about um, how we can represent these in a large, uh, in, in geometric space, in a large dimensional space. Um, one example uh, that you can use GANs for is for compression. Um, this is uh, taking an, an image and compressing it to something um, like less than half of its original, or maybe ha around half of its original size, while maintaining a lot of the details and um, being able to um, programmatically uh, kind of reproduce all those details when you need them. So it looks pretty similar um, when you decompress it to the original. Um, and uh, we can represent these things as tensors. So tensors are um, kind of just a, a generalization of an array. We use tensors all the time. We have uh, very tiny tensors like um, scalars and uh, vectors. And you have uh, arrays, which are uh, one-dimensional tensors, and matrices, which are two-dimensional. And these represent um, data points. This is a data point here in some high dimensional space. Um, and this is how we represent data, how we feed it to the algorithm. We have uh, lots and lots of numbers in some cube, uh, or uh, generalization of a cube, and these are, these are matrices. And we, we use these um, as inputs to the machine learning. And usually, we take lots and lots of data and, um, 
And when we, we've learned the, the, the concept correctly, it'll output a small and very small amount of data. So you can think of this as, as the input, and the output is just a very, very um, small array, or even uh, a binary, yes or no. Usually this is um, uh, kind of a very classic problem. You have uh, lots and lots of data. You have an image. Is this image a bus or something like that? Is, is this um, video recording, which is even uh, higher dimensional, uh, is this uh, a video of um, you know, the, the play, um, uh, choose your favorite play? Uh, so th this is something that um, we'd like to be able to, to, to do. And uh, humans can do it, but machines are still catching up. So um, we can think of these, these images and lots of uh, real-world objects as um, sampled from uh, a distribution that's kind of like a platonic distribution, like a platonic solid, where you have like a perfect sphere. There's no such thing as a perfect sphere, but there's lots of balls in, in the world, right? And uh, these are uh, sampled from that distribution. It's kind of in our imagination. And uh, when we receive it, it we, we have um, something a little bit noisy, but it's nearby um, what this, this function would, would, would output. Um, some more examples of uh, generation. We can use this for language uh, as well. So this is, this is an example of um, oh how we can treat uh, lots of images. Um, and we can just average them together. And so we can do lots of mathematical operations on these tensors that will make it easy for you to, um, uh, to do simple ar arithmetic operations, like averaging and moving around the space, will translate to something you can visualize like this. Um, so an average uh, smiling neutral face, uh, male neutral face, and then um, an average smiling male face. And then you can um, kind of uh, take the vector between these two two points and uh, smoothly go between that. And this is what you see. Um, for languages as well, uh, there's this tool called uh, a word embedding. Um, and there's different implementations of this. Or this is a word embedding. And um, it's called word to vec So we take uh, a word or a sentence, and we, we translate this to um, a, a vector of, of like floating point or um, uh, in, in integers, and and you can do this um, for lots of different languages, and uh, you can do this in such a way that uh, similar words map to similar regions of space, no matter which language you're using. Um, given a large corpus of uh, of books, you have like um, a book that's written in English, uh, maybe like War and Peace, and it's translated into uh, another language. And then you have each of these words, and you can map these to points in the, the space from the person who translated it in the original language. And this is just a number. So we can think of lots of things as just numbers. This is a very um, you know, natural thing, very common thing to do in machine learning and statistics. Um, and you can preserve like, relationships between uh, similar points in this space. Um, when, 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 you, when you project these, these words and things like this, you can um, find interesting relationships. Uh, like the relationship between uh, king and queen. If you take a king and subtract man and add woman, then you'll get a queen. Um, similarly, uh, you can uh, find you know, similar verbs. And um, given something like this, let's say uh, you have a capital of a country, um, and you want to find which country it is. Well. Uh, you, can, you can use something like, like word embedding to, to get that uh, relationship. Um, so there's lots of things you could do with natural language processing, for image processing. Um, for machine learning, uh, we have this very classic um, example. And if you've been to my, the previous session, and this will just briefly um, kind of intersect with that. But uh, we have this idea of supervised learning, where you have lots of data and lots of labels. And you want to um, learn. Uh, the mapping of label to data. So you receive a new item in your data set um, that's unlabeled, and you want to pr provide it, uh, get, assign it a label. Uh, this is um, classification, or it's also called um, logistic regression for whatever reason. But um, that's, that's the goal. So you have uh, two classes here. This is a binary classification task. 
and two dimensions. Um, so this is kind of the simplest, one of the simplest ways we could, we could imagine um, classification. And um, you have two classes here. So this is a binary classification task. And it's linearly, they're gonna, we're going to say they're linearly separable. So as we're, um, we're learning uh, where to draw this line, we're going to um, find uh, a line of best fit that separates these classes most cleanly. Um, and there'll be some on this side and some on this side. But the idea is that um, this, is, this kind of approximates the actual boundary in some space between two classes. Um, and who here remembers the equation for uh, a line? Um, say just in two dimensions. Y equals mx plus b, right? Yep. So we're going to try to learn um, m and b. We don't know what these are, but we have to learn uh, these, these two parameters. And that's our model. That's going to be a, uh, what we, we learn. Um, so given some data, uh, we want to classify this data. Um, initially, uh, you know, we, let's say we, we don't have the weights, but we've already learned the weights now. If you want to classify this, um, we take each of the um, attributes each, in each of the dimensions and then multiply them by the weight. Um, and uh, this is going to give us uh, a, a number. And if this is less than zero, we're going to say it's one class. And if it's greater than zero, we're going to say it's another class. It's arbitrary what we label these as, zero, one. So it doesn't really matter. But uh, the important part is um, the weights. We have to learn what these are. And, uh, and here what we're doing is just we're taking two um, one-dimensional arrays and concatenating them into a two-dimensional array. Um, so uh, is anyone here? Uh, okay, so this, this is, this is um, each of the data points. This is the, the data point, and this is the weight. And uh, we're going to multiply them together and then get the prediction um, for each of these inside of. So we're going to sum this all up when we're done. This is going to give us um, an output. And if it's less than zero, it's a threshold. So it's going to be zero and so forth. So how do we get these, these weights? Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a simple iterative process. What we do, at, we consider each, um, each item in our data set. And uh, they have some features. Uh, we're going to concatenate one um, since there's no, one represents the thing uh, that comes before uh, B or C in your equation. Um, so there's no coefficient for that. We're just going to say it's always one. Um, and we're trying to learn uh, what these are. Um, so initially, we set the total error to be uh, some threshold. And while it's greater than that threshold, we're going to do this procedure. Uh, we're going to go over the data set. And we're going to update uh, the weight for that, um, that, that attribute, in which case the weight is, is just is B here or m, excuse me, mx. Um, and uh, we're going to update that in the direction opposite to the error. So we have some uh, classification. Let's say initially, initially our, all our weights are 0 or random. And we're going to get a bunch of them wrong. So let's say we classify it as a 1, and the actual label is 0, then it's going to be negative. So it's going to update the weight. It's going to make the weight smaller. And if, if we classify it as, uh, if if it's if the true label is one, it's going to make it larger, uh, and we classify it as a zero. It's going to make it larger. And this is going to be multiplied. I'm going to take this, add um, the error, multiply by a small rate, and multiply by the uh, the attribute. Um, and we're going to do this a bunch of different times. So for each item in our data set, we're going to do this: compute the total error, and then update the total error, and then do it all over again. Um, and this is this is this algorithm here is called the perceptron, uh, sort of the very simplest, earliest neural uh, implementation. We can take these, and we we can use these to um, to draw a line in any arbitrary space. Um, it can have lots of different dimensions, and uh, this line is guaranteed to be um, the optimum, the best line. Uh, for, for that class. As long as it's linearly separable and this rate is sufficiently small, it will always converge to the line that best separates these two classes. Um, and this is what it looks like 
as it's converging. So it's drawing this line. We're updating the, the, uh, the slope and the offset from the origin. And eventually, it kind of slowly converges to something that's, that's the least, has the least error. Um, does that make sense? OK. So once we understand that, we run into a problem where if we have um, a line, you, you, this algorithm draws a line, basically, between two classes. And um, we're assuming that these classes are linearly separable, which is often not the case. If it is, then we can just go home. We've, we've, we've solved the problem, right? But very often, we have um, boundaries that we'd like to draw between classes that form like circles or uh, shapes that are not linear. Uh, so we want to get uh, this to work to draw these lines that are not, uh, that are not you know, a line or a plane or some hyperplane. Uh, it's some region, usually, inside of our, da our, set, uh, our data set, some region inside that space that's, um, that's not, usually not linear. Sometimes it is. We get lucky. So uh, researchers thought about this for a long time, and they actually came up with a pretty good solution. Um, in, like, this was known in the 80s. But you take these perceptrons and you stack them together. So you take these inputs, you pass them in, some weights, into another set of perceptrons. Here, this is called um, uh, the hidden layer. Uh, and then you have an output layer here, which, which is just, they're all the same unit. These units um, are, they can, they can be thought of as perceptrons, but usually they have some different properties. So one is the output, um, sometimes is we want it to be smooth. Um, so you noticed in the last one, it was a step function. It's very important for this to be smooth because we want to be able to differentiate this, um, uh, which is kind of just a fancy word of following that, um, that slope downhill. Uh, so this, this, um, this will give us uh, the mechanism to do that. So this is known as uh, a neural net. And we, we have, uh, we've gotten these to work for a long time. And they worked OK. But uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, they didn't pursue them after that. They thought, well, they seem to have, you know, perceptrons seem to have this, this problem that they don't work very well um, for nonlinear boundaries. And so we're going to work on something else for a while. And so this, this was kind of the state of the art um, then, and it uh, didn't work so well. Um, but with this, you can draw arbitrary, uh, if you have enough of these, you can draw arbitrary boundaries. Um, so to get this to work really well, uh, what you need to learn how to figure out how to do, which we also um, knew then, was how to, to back propagate the weights. So you have all of these weights are what you're learning, right? You have these, these weights here and these weights here. Initially, they're random, but you want to get them to, um, to, to some ideal value. And uh, how do we get that? Well, for our entire training set, um, usually this is, this is done something like this. Um, and, and this is very kind of a, a very uh, naive implementation. But your idea here is that. Um, you initialize the weights randomly, like we did before, for uh, the perceptron. And um, until this error stops decreasing, usually it will kind of start pretty high. The error for the, uh, the model will start high, and then it will kind of slowly go down. Well, while this stops decreasing, we're going to do this procedure. Um, so for each item in the, the training set, for each uh, data item, we're going to compute um, the, what we said it was going to be. And remember, this has a label. So um, the, the actual uh, label assigned to this, um, which we didn't tell our algorithm, we, we compare that. That gives us an error with respect to uh, this layer here. So we recompute these um, the same way by, um, by following the direction of the, of the error, which gives us um, this kind of a slope to follow. And then the trick here is, which is kind of, this is pseudocode, but the trick here is that uh, you want to back propagate this. So you have to have compute the error for that, um, the, the next 
uh, when you iterate this, this is going to go up and this is going to go down, right? And then you have to figure out which weights here will give you the weights that you have, that you have now in this layer. Um, and that, that will take some, some special uh, calculus that we won't have time to go over. But the idea here is just basically you're, 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 you're rolling a ball down a hill um, where the hill is uh, something called the objective function. This is like the error surface. So high regions in the error surface correspond to um, high uh, regions where, where there's, there's a lot of error coming out of the model. And so we want to um, tweak these, these weights in such a way so that um, this decreases. And so you can do that iteratively in a process called uh, backpropagation. It works. Um, sometimes this, this particular method, where, where, you sit, where you go over the entire training set, update the weights, and then go over it again, this takes a long time. So this isn't very efficient. So usually what they do is compute the uh, error with respect to a small set of the, the training set and then update it, or even a single data item. But uh, in the ideal case, it looks something like this, where you're kind of smoothly following this to the lowest point. And the lowest point corresponds to the lowest error um, for your model. So the, the, the f it outputs the fewest amount of mistakes. And once it gets there, usually it stabilizes. This may take a long, long time to, to get there. But this is one form of optimization. You can use this to um, optimize your, your model, your neural net. Um, and uh, this, this is something that works well enough. If you do this, you can draw arbitrary boundaries. You can draw arbitrary shapes in any space. It turns out that um, you can do it, uh, you can solve the, the sort of classic uh, XOR problem, which is, with a single layer, you can't do that. You can't, but with two, you can do something like this. And uh, with three, you can draw like multiple, three layers, you can draw multiple boundaries. And, uh, Turns out for real world problems, like uh, classifying dogs and cats, the boundary will be actually very jagged. And uh, in, that, in that, that natural space, it will be very difficult to, um, to get it to, to learn the actual boundary between these classes. But eventually it will do so. And uh, it turns out that if you add enough of these layers, you can do some pretty cool stuff. So this is, uh, you start adding more and more uh, units per layer and, more, and add more and more layers. And this is, uh, this is what we call deep learning, or deep neural net. So anyway, um, once you have this, then uh, you can start to do image recognition. And um, th there's some tweaks to this, but the, the basic unit can be thought of as a neuron, but sometimes this is not a very good analogy. So, uh, so we just call it like a, a unit, but it's, it, it forms something like this. It's, it's, a, it's a graph where the information flows from this side, the inputs, and you get some outputs here. Um, where these outputs usually represent either a single binary, yes or no, or uh, the outputs could be um, uh, like a, uh, an encoding uh, that you want to learn. So um, for example, if you want to learn some classes here, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, for digits. This is a very classic example. The output will, will be, for 0, it will be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to the end. For 1, it will be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 all the way to 9. And so this is one encoding to do that. But Yep. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So um, when we think about uh, fitting uh, a model, so we, th this idea that we can, um, we're trying to learn this boundary, but sometimes we get really, really good at learning this. In fact, too good, and it doesn't generalize well. And this is called overfitting, where we, we learn this boundary, but the boundary is, is, it represents quirks in our data set, where the data set is sampled from this, this large distribution we don't have access to. But uh, we're learning kind of um, quirky behavior inside of our data set, which isn't real. Uh, it turns out that um, when you're training these things, 
you, you initially, you don't start off with like a, a bunch of layers. You start off with a few, and there's no kind of tried and true method how to do this. But uh, this guy, um, Yashua Bengio, he says that um, how do you know when to stop adding more layers? Well, you do this until uh, the error stops uh, decreasing. Um, so it's not a science. It's uh, very much still that tr you know, trial and error. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's the, the basic idea. And these units can take different forms, which we'll talk about. But uh, the idea is that you have a bunch of different images. And you can start to, to distinguish between um, maybe thousands of different types of images if you have a large enough neural net and enough data. It turns out that um, data is often more important than the actual model. But uh, in this example, this ImageNet LSVR competition, a large-scale visual recognition task, you have um, a bunch of different images. Uh, and this is all open source. So once they open source this, this data set with the labels, then you can start training on this. And it get, started getting very good at identifying um, objects in images. Um, uh, so the task here is to predict um, uh, one that's in the top five labels for that image. So someone, some human labeled this image with a, you know, a bunch of different labels. And your goal uh, for them to build a, is to build a model that will predict um, the, one of the top five um, subjects inside of this image. So how does it do this? It uses a slightly different kernel uh, or a unit. And, and that unit is called, uh, it's a fancy name, it's like, called a kernel. But the idea here is, is very simple. Um, you've probably seen something like this if you work with image recognition, um, where you're passing a filter over an image. And that filter represents a small matrix. Um, as you're doing this, you're, you're multiplying each item in the matrix by the underlying pixel value, summing it up, and then um, uh, outputting that. So sometimes um, it will output the image of the same size, in which case um, you'll have to pad it on the outside. But it works something like this. So with these different um, kernels, you'll produce an image that's slightly um, blurred or um, you know, it emphasizes edges. It does uh, some counterintuitive things you wouldn't uh, you know, think it would do. But um, with these kernels, you can, um, you can do some very simple image processing transformation tasks. Um, and uh, here, this is called a convolution. Um, com complicated word, but very simple uh, idea, which is that when you're doing this, um, this is convolving these underlying features into a number. So here, you have this matrix, right? And uh, this matrix is, is transforming these image values into a number. So we are summing this all up and then outputting that. And it's, it's sort of throwing away some of the data in the image, uh, getting a slightly smaller image as an output. And uh, it makes it a little easier to work with. So when we, when we just do a, like a, a filter passing over the image, let's say we, we use something called um, a canny edge detector, which is, I believe it's, um, it's one of these, it's, so I think it's, I want to say it's this one or, or, or that one. But if we do that, then it'll emphasize the edges um, of the image. Uh, so this is, this is one type of filter. Um, sometimes it, it works uh, very well for, for doing, you know, uh, simple segmentation tasks. Uh, uh, if, you're, if you have, like, you want to identify a box in an image, like the shape of a sign, you can do that. In some images, it doesn't work so well. Um, you have lots of texture and stuff. But that's the output. Another one is called a Gaussian kernel, which kind of blurs everything. Uh, so you have an, an original image, and you get the blurred output of that. And that's, uh, that's one type of, of kernel. But anyway, we use these as, as, as units in our neural net, right? So this, this convolutional neural net, which is called one of the early kind of implementations of um, neural nets for doing image recognition, uses a t technique slightly similar to this multilayer perceptron, which you talked about earlier. The MLP, or multilayer perceptron, was just operating on the raw 
inputs um, and, and passing out um, a, a, a real valued output. But uh, here we're, what we're doing is we're sliding this, this kernel over an image and then the output is going to be um, passed into another uh, layer which will then take that and sort of sample that again. And so this will transform the image in um, slightly subtle ways. And uh, initially it will, it will you know, extract features that look like um, edges or corners. And then uh, as you kind of go further and further up, it will, it will start to look like shapes and things like that. Uh, it uses this, this technique called pooling, which just reduces, throws away some of the data. Because a lot of the, the data uh, that we're using is, is way too much data. So we have a, a one megapixel image. Um, you don't need all that data to do the classification. Um, so if you detect images like in, nat in the natural setting, you have things like lines, um, simple patterns. And uh, as you get higher and higher up, the, it's learning abstractions. So uh, how these patterns relate to each other. And uh, you might end up with patterns here, like shapes of beaks and um, things like uh, circles and eyes and things like that. So the initial, the first layer of given some input data will produce something, you, you know, small, small level, low level features. And uh, it will kind of start to, to learn representations of these in different orientations. And so this, is, this works very well for um, images that don't come in a standard orientation. Sometimes it will be flipped and it will come in different shapes and sizes. Um, so this is a, a called a convolutional neural net. And when we're done, what we've learned is these, uh, these Kernel, kernels for each of these, these layers, and they're, they're little matrices. Um, and it's, ju it's just a bunch of uh, uh, matrices that we've learned, and then that when, we, when we've learned this well enough, our, our error will be low on the output side. So th the architecture is not so important. It's just getting you familiar with the idea of how these things work. And it turns out that you can do something called transfer learning by chopping off some of these layers and then retraining the rest of the model uh, using your data set. So for example, um, let's say you have a model here. The Google Inception model is trained on this, this large um, scale visual recognition task. You can retrain that on your own task. So say you, you don't want to recognize hamburgers. You want to recognize like trucks and cars. You can take the low level features that it's learned and then retrain that using the higher level uh, features that, that you need um, for your data set, which may be you know, like wheels and uh, license plates and so forth. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this this here um, will will represent uh, the 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 average uh, for for all, all the in your, inside your data set, right? Each of these represents. Um, some, some, some region of the image that's most highly activated, um, most uh, uh, responds most sharply to, to that particular uh, region in the image. Um, Uh, the, so if you if you choose um, yeah so if you choose a different image if you a single image and you pass it into this neural net then um, you'll find that the the early layers will output something that um, that highlights different um, small features inside that image um, and it will activate most sharply so this is what this is doing is it's it's visualizing the output of those inner layers before you get to the output um, that, uh, that respond most, most sharply to that particular image. Uh, when you get to the output, you end up with something uh, that's, that's just uh, discrete values. So you won't much, m interesting things are what's in the inner layers, so the, the middle layers. 
And it turns out you don't need to connect all these layers together. You can just use something called dropout, where you, you drop a bunch of the connections. And you can still get very good results. So this is kind of speeding this up. Um, so let's take, a look at, let's take a look at some code and uh, maybe see if we can uh, figure out how this works. Um, so I have uh, some sample code I've written for TensorFlow that will do um, image uh, recognition for MNIST. MNIST, remember, is the, uh, the, the 28 by 28 uh, uh, pixel image that you, where you have an output that gives you, um, is this image a handwritten digit of one, of two, of three, and so forth. And the data uh, is provided to us um, as, as an open source data set as part of TensorFlow. Uh, so when I'm training this, uh, there's different ways to do it. That here's what an image looks like. One of these images might look something like, like this, right? And uh, I, I, what happens when you, when you train this, this model is that um, you can use different, different things. You can use a multi-layer perceptron. Um, and this is written by, this is available in the TensorFlow examples. Or uh, this is one person's TensorFlow example. Um, but uh, he, he wrote this simple example for a multi-layer perceptron. It turns out that you can get pretty good results with MLP, um, but a lot of the state-of-the-art stuff is done using the convolutional neural net, or a CNN. And um, uh, you, you, can, you can train that. Um, it takes a long time to train. I did it on the cloud and then serialized the result. And then once you um, want to classify a single example, what you can do is uh, just deserialize those weights that you've learned, and, um, and hopefully it will classify it uh, correctly. So let's try editing that image. So these are inverted, uh, black and white. But um, let's see if we can recognize uh, like a three. Um, so, yes, go ahead. Um, yeah. So the, the the more layers you have, the the more uh, kind of. Uh, levels of abstraction you're, you're putting into it. But the features you're learning are the actual um, the matrix values inside of each of these layers. Um, yeah, so you can, you can do some, some, um, some reverse engineering where you, you find uh, the the, the, the images, uh, you should try to visualize what these, these in hidden layers are encoding, but it's not always very intuitive. Um, and I, I want to um, demonstrate uh, just how this works with M MNIST. But uh, the hidden layers, the output of these, this is just kind of give you some, um, some intuition of how, how it's, what it's learning in the inside. We don't have a very good um, intuition of uh, what it's doing. Sometimes we treat these as black boxes. But yeah, so so and uh, in in the let me see if I understand you correctly. In um, the output of these hidden layers in the network, um, you, 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 you can take the output of these, and it, it might make sense in, um, if, if, if you map this back to an image, yeah, you, 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 can, you can say, like, this image has a curve here, or some, some kind of loop. This might be. Um, in, uh, highly activated by lots of things. So the, for one of these components, um, twos and eights will look very similar. 
because it's just taking a look at maybe some, some curve or something like this. But I, I don't understand. I'm not sure what you're saying. Ah, so the you but can we, I mean, can we uh, say anything by saying that those vectors that, okay, so this, uh, these features, for, for example, that they have uh, two cases together there, mm -hmm. so that means there are two cases features, like, right? so this feature represents curves, mm -hmm. and this feature represents uh, something else. Mm -hmm. Oh, these, these will be uh, fixed as, as you're learning them. So they, they will slowly kind of um, uh, change as you feed it more data. But once it's, um, well, once, it's, once it's trained, if you have two images then of dogs, and there's, there's a, a, let's say one of these rep detects like some fur or something like that, then both of the, for both images, this, this, will bo this, uh, this unit will, will be activated very highly for both of these images. Um, and uh, that you can use that to, uh, to do some, some interesting things with image um, uh, generation. But uh, in, initially, initially, they'll all be random. And as, as you're learning it, um, these will converge on, on some, some region of space ba based on how you randomize the initial va values. And then finally, once it's trained, if you have two images of dogs and they're, they're sort of similar, then um, the low level uh, the low level units will, will, will be activated kind of in unison. And then the higher level units may, might um, be very, very different. So these are, th these are learning some very convoluted um, uh, uh, transformation of the, the input, the raw input uh, vector. Um, so it's taking all of these. And then initially, the low level ones might be activated for similar images, similar uh, units will be activated. But higher up, um, they, they, they'll start to uh, look very different. But then the output, when you get it, these will both be dogs, right? That's the goal. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I wanted to uh, just demonstrate this very quickly. And yep. Uh, specific for image processing. Uh, yep. Um, so you can use uh, TensorFlow out of the box, and it will work very well for image processing. Um, you'll need to do some simple transformation of the, the, the file itself to get the actual um, pixel values, because the format doesn't give you that. But um, you can use a library uh, like Pandas or a scikit-learn to get from the, the, the file itself to the vector, the data you need to get it in the format that TensorFlow expects. Um, in the end, it's just going to be a matrix, but you just need to get it into that format. And there's a few libraries you can use. Uh, one of them is a library called um, uh, uh, Pandas. Uh, and I use that a lot for, um, for ingesting the data and feeding it to TensorFlow. Um, so let's take a look at how this is. OK, so this correctly predicted a 3 for my digit. Um, does someone want to come up here and uh, draw a digit, see if I train this? Um, when, when, when you train this, it should work pretty well um, on anybody's handwriting. Um, this is using a sort of a naive method, the MLP. This is trained on the MLP. Uh, we can use a comnet as well, and you'll get a little more accurate results. Do we have a volunteer uh, who wants to use uh, to write a, uh, a digit? on the screen. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Sometimes people are tricky. They say, uh, oh, no, sorry, you have to do it on here. Uh, Okay, so just so we're clear, is that a, is that a, that's a six, right? Yeah, you okay. Can okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, sounds good. Um, uh, let's see. 
So, oh, we've got to save that. Make sure we're saving. So um, when, we, when we serialize this, uh, once we've learned it, we want to make sure we serialize it. We save it to disk. So all these, these values for the, the weights that we've learned um, are being saved uh, to, to somewhere on, on disk so we don't learn, lose all of our training progress. It happens in memory, and we save it to disk. Um, and uh, when, we're, when we're using the, um, the MLP, uh, we, we just create the model uh, the same way we did before. In fact, you could serialize that as well, the model, and then use that um, to recreate the output. But here we have um, just some weights and biases, and uh, we're using the MLP to give us a prediction. Uh, and that will we'll take that prediction. It's going to be in something called a one-hot encoding. We're going to take that and uh, map that back to real digits. Um, uh, so in, in TensorFlow, you have um, a bunch of different tools, and they're a little bit like uh, a toolbox. You have the wrenches and things like that. You really have to put this stuff together um, in uh, something that it's not a great API, to be um, completely honest. Like the raw TensorFlow API will not give you uh, a very nice syntax and API to work with your data. If you want that, uh, you can use something uh, called Keras. Um, Keras is a library built on top of TensorFlow that will allow you to define uh, the structure of your neural net um, in a very uh, object-oriented fashion. So you have um, something here that looks a little bit nicer to use, where you just define the layers. You want like uh, here we're using uh, one, two, three layers that are fully connected. They're dense layers. Um, initially, we have uh, 784 pixels, 28 by 28 uh, binary uh, black and white image. And um, uh, you'll get out uh, of that. You'll want, so this, this particular architecture for the neural net will, will output um, 784. It will move that to, um, uh, to a 512. And then uh, finally get the final layer will be just 10. Um, and there will be different activation functions for these. Um, but these are, these are just different ways to get it to converge more quickly. And you can use um, some other tools inside of this to, to get it to train a little bit, little bit better. But um, typically, you want to implement uh, something uh, in, that's already been implemented. You want to take some, some paper or something like that and implement that in code. And the, the goal there is, is just to be um, as simple as possible. So, um, I highly recommend using Keras um, over TensorFlow unless you really need to um, do some research or engineer your own units. Because here, the units come out of the box. Um, and uh, you, can, you can work with the data uh, very easily um, in a kind of a high-level API, which is nice. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a, just a, a quick look at MNIST for, um, for doing uh, for, for, with, with TensorFlow. Um, there's lots of different architectures for neural nets. Um, you can compose um, a, a lot of these using the primitives that TensorFlow gives you, but it will a lot of work and a lot of code. Uh, so for a simple kind of feed-forward neural net, which is what we're using, um, then uh, you'll end up with something like this. If you're fully connected, they'll each of the units will be connected to each other in the next layer. Um, but you can specify things like dropout. Uh, and um, if you're using a common net, you can do like strides, where the kernel is stepping over certain parts of the image. And uh, you can configure a lot of these parameters. Uh, they're called hyperparameters using that high-level API instead of doing it all on, on your own. Um, See if there's anything else I want to go over. Oh, OK. So um, we, briefly, we talked about earlier um, something called uh, overfitting. And I want to kind of give you one solution to, to fix that. Um, but there's lots of different ways you could fix it. One is to use something uh, called regularization, where you penalize uh, com models that are overly complicated. This is usually just a parameter you pass into the model. You say uh, regularization uh, true. 
or you can use a particular regularization that um, penalizes extra parameters. So really what you want here is some, li some line of best fit that looks like this. But what you end up with is something that looks like this. And when you, when you deploy this model, it might work very well for your own data set, your training set. When you deploy it to production, uh, the, the, the accuracy goes way down because this line, that, this, this green line, would be over, overfitted to your data. In which case, um, when you receive new data from the real world, then uh, it, will, it, 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 won't rep, it won't be the actual line. So it, the actual line we might want to draw is something like this between these two classes. And, uh, and you, can, you can use uh, different methods to kind of defeat this. One is like use a test set and a validation set. Um, let me see if I have the, the slide here. So usually uh, when you're partitioning your data, um, you want to break it up so that uh, it sees certain parts of the training set. So um, this way, slices of the training set will be um, exposed to the, the model at, the, while it's during training. And you might train a bunch of these. And that, that will also um, help avoid uh, overfitting to the shape of your training set. So you don't, the idea is simple. You just don't show it all of your data. Um, uh, there's this trade-off uh, which is sort of related to this in machine learning. And that's the, um, the, this, this idea that there, we have two different um, concepts of, of best fit, uh, a, a good model. Um, one is that it has no bias um, or no preferred um, uh, orientation or no, no preferred kind of uh, um, for, for any given dimension. It doesn't sway too, too far to the left or the right or up or down. And, um, and that's, that's well and good, but we want to have something that's low variance and low bias. It's not too spread out and it's also not very biased. And this is very, very difficult to get. We usually end up somewhere over here uh, in one of these two areas. And you have to look at your particular application, how, um, what, 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 what's best for you. But you probably won't be able to get something that's, that's dead on um, on your first try. Um, so in order to get around that, um, you need to kind of try different parameters initially and find um, a bunch of different models and then choose the one which um, has the best, uh, maybe, may maybe your, your function that you're trying to optimize is like um, cost or, uh, to the company. And you're developing um, some algorithm that uh, throws away uh, you know, things that are manufactured. So you have um, something that estimates you know, the size and shape of it. And if there's a certain tolerance of, of error that beyond that, and you just throw it away. So if you're, if you're um, you, you might be, uh, you know, tempted to, to have something that throws away a bunch of different um, uh, widgets that you produce, a bunch of different um, items. However, this is going to have a very high cost. Um, so you could be very accurate. You could detect every single um, uh, item that, that, has, that has an error, that has a, a mistake with a certain tolerance. But um, you, you could also waste a lot of money. If it, and another, another example is cancer, right? If you say everybody has cancer, then you're, you patch everybody who has cancer. But um, it's extremely expensive uh, to, 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 to test everybody for cancer, to, to do ra you know, um, radiotherapy, if you say everybody has cancer. So um, you have to kind of look at uh, the, 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 the ratio of true positives to false positives um, and, and how this impacts your bottom line, whatever you're trying to optimize for. Um, one point that I think uh, doesn't get discussed very often and which is very important is the, the idea of, well, what are you using to, to, to train your model? And this is another uh, area where I think people will just say, well, um, let's do it on the cloud. But it may be, uh, if you're doing this a lot um, you, you know, training this over months and months, it may be more cost effective to just get your own machine. Um, so this is something you have to consider. If you're doing something for um, many months, then there will be uh, a point where 
if you just build your own machine with a bunch of, put a bunch of GPUs in there and, uh, and use that uh, for your development, then it will be much cheaper. So it turns out that um, the, the, the kind of tra tipping point where it's more cost effective to do on your own rather than uploading to the cloud, training it a bunch of hours, is um, somewhere like around three or four months you'll get um, return on your investment. Um, I, I don't want to go too much into unsupervised learning because we went over that, but this is one technique you can use to reduce the dimensions and to uh, get things um, in, a, in, a, in a shape where you can do more supervised learning on that. Um, in fact, you can use this uh, for the MNIST data set particularly to first kind of uh, project it into a small amount of dimensions and then do something like, um, uh, you know, like, uh, like k-means on that and, or do some simple supervised algorithm on those smaller dimensions. And you'll get very good accuracy as well. One thing that people kind of jump into this and they say, well, let's throw the most um, advanced um, neural net at it, at the problem. And that, that's not always the best way to get started. Very often for a lot of problems, especially if you're not dealing with images or with sound or something very complicated, if you just have numbers, then um, you can, might be able to solve the problem analytically, which is that you might be able to find a solution to um, the, the a model that has a, a certain set of parameters that's optimal in, um, by, analyti by analytically finding the, the solution. So typically in, in math, you know, when we're finding the minimum, you, there's two, two, uh, two options you have. You can follow kind of a path by making small adjustments and searching through that space, or you can just um, quickly resolve the absolute global minimum using a simple um, algorithm. So there's a, there's a closed form solution for uh, linear regression um, that will give you the best um, output. You don't have to do like machine learning on it. You can just automatically solve the problem. If it's in a small, um, a small set of dimensions, then you might be able to solve this very quickly. And that's, um, that's something you should think about doing. Um, so there's a bunch of resources to get started learning about this uh, technology. Um, and I encourage you to check them out. Um, one is uh, the, this, this course from Stanford, uh, CS231. It has a good mathematical background if you're interested in learning more about the mathematics behind this. Um, if you're not interested in that and you just want to start writing code, check out this last one. Um, highly recommend that. Uh, the links will be available uh, after the presentation. I've provided them. Uh, and this is probably the most single accessible um, uh, resource that I found uh, for, for just if you want to write code and you want to start hacking on this stuff. Um, data sets are very important. Uh, you can try uh, your hand at exploring different public data sets. In, this is a GitHub repo that has a bunch of different public data sets from uh, the US, from India, from all over the world. Um, you can try to find patterns in these. Uh, the code for, that we use today will be available at this repository and um, uh, just those URLs in case you're interested. Um, I give like a special thanks to our hosts and uh, for you uh, coming here today and spending your time. I want to